Okay, so welcome back for this last part <laughs> of these lectures on midfield games. So let me remove my mask. Um, so for the very f last part of this lecture, I would like to discuss some possible impact of the common noise onto the game itself. And when I say impact, I mean that maybe the question would be uh, that noise is helpful in the analysis. When I say noise, I mean common noise, not only the, the independent noises, but also the common noise. So this is, uh, this is the purpose of these, uh, of these lectures. And I will show you some examples. Don't expect a general theory, but some examples. So this primary slide is about, generally speaking, the impact of the noise in stochastic analysis. So here in this slide, uh, there, is no, there is no mean field. There is no mean field game and there is no mean field impact. This is just to say that it is a common feature in, in, in probability theory to, to wonder about the positive impact of the noise onto the analysis or onto the solvability <coughs> of a model, of a stochastic model. And so this is a very famous result. Uh, maybe you, you know it, certainly you know it. And if not, I think that this is something that is interesting for you. So you start with some dynamics. Uh, typically an ordinary differential equation and you assume that this is ill posed typically the velocity field is bounded but it's not Lipschitz so let's think of a, a continuous bounded velocity field so you know that there are some solutions to the uh, uh, to the differential equation you know this by compactness but you're not able to say many many things about uniqueness and there might not be many things. And something that is absolutely amazing is that if you put, if you force the dynamics by means of a noise, then you restore the noise. And this is something that is, I find it very, uh, very impressive. And so the shape of the new dynamics is just the same equation, but you plug in addition to Granin increments. And so the the reason that you have behind is that under the under the the, the presence of the of the Brown motion, there is a kind of averaging phenomenon that is going to smooth out the singularities of the velocity field. This is more or less what happens with noise. And for sure, this result, in fact, when you have a look at the proof, uh, this is very much connected to PD results. I'm not saying that this is the only manner. There are several manners to to attack this question, but historically. Uh, let's say that the main strategy is to have a look at the corresponding PD and to benefit from the fact that the corresponding PD itself has smooth solution under the presence of the noise. So I guess that every know, everybody knows this now. If you have a look at the, the corresponding PD, this is set in a backward sense, uh, which is the usual manner in probability theory. So you have that the PD now features this Laplace. And in fact, you can recall uh, this, um, this stochastic differential equation as the characteristics of the speed. And you use that and in the analysis, this is a way to see the impact of it. So you could wonder about similar equations uh, for mean field games. So would it be possible to use uh, uh, the common noise as a way to modify a mean field game and to enforce in some way a uniqueness of solutions. So this would be the analog of what you have here. Well, this is, this is a difficult question in the general setting. And so far, we don't have a, a, global, a global answer to this question. Uh, but I will show you that we have some partial answers in some cases. Uh, and maybe you will see that this is exactly the phenomenon, the phenomenon that you see here. You see here. And then once I have told you about this, we'll try to move forward and to see, uh, uh, to see some applications or to see uh, uh, related results. So I will concentrate myself first on a toy example. So certainly this is a very good way for you after uh, three lectures to have a little bit of a fresh air and uh, you make a break and uh, you sit and uh, 
you have a look at a quite simple model and you see in this simple model all the things that we have done in, uh, in three ventures. So this model is very much connected with, with the previous ones, except that you now simplify even more uh, the shape of the, the, the coefficients. So as a key fact or as a key point, so these are the same dynamics as before. So let's say that sigma is equal to one, so to recover exactly the same setting. But you see that in the class function also, there is nothing that is really, really new in the, um, in the energy, but in the in the shape of the coefficients, you see that this is quadratic in the space variable. So you, you get or you use quadratic functionals uh, in the space variable. And to simplify, you take function of the uh, of the measures, which are in of the measure, which are in fact functions of the mean or the expectation that this is the mean, this is better the mean of the measure, the expectation of any random variable we have, which has this measure as distribution. So you have some coefficients C, G, and C, F, but you don't really care about, about them. This could be more or less everything in that, that, that you want. And well, sigma typically you think as being one, this is what I told you, but in fact, sigma could be equal to zero in this model. The reason is that since the coefficients in the, in the optimization problem are convex in, uh, in X. In fact, um, there is no big need, big uh, need of, uh, of assuming of putting an additional diffusivity. This is not uh, very useful at the, at the point of view of the regularity of the object that you have. Uh, and so once again, new bar is, is the mean, so the mean of the measure. And so the very first thing is that you wonder about uh, the shape of the, uh, Maybe that uh, you see well. Uh, you wonder about the shape of the, the minimizers. So, so when you are given the environment, you wonder about the minimizers of this uh, of this problem. And so this is something that you can do. Um, you can observe that when you compute, either you solve the HAB equation when u is given, or you apply the Pontry again principle. And in fact, because of the convexity of the coefficients, the pontry again principle will be a necessary and sufficient condition in this setting. And then if you, if you study uh, in, uh, in either, either way the, the problem, you will see that the feedback function, when, when the, the population is given, the feedback function is linear in X. And this is just to say that you keep, uh, you keep track of the quadratic structure of the cost and so of the linear structure of the derivative at the level of the optimal strategy. And so once again, the optimal feedback is a linear function of X. I should say affine, function, affine function of X. Uh, and, and so this is what you see here. So you have a linear coefficient eta and plus a remainder uh, intercept. So maybe let's say a remainder of zero order term. And the very good point is that this eta, in fact, and this is why one of the interests of this model, this eta is very simple to compute. And I will tell you how to compute this next. But basically, eta does not depend on you. This is what you observe when you do the computation for the simple reason that the coefficients that you have in front of this, so C, F, and C, G, which explain the quadratic nature of the model, that they are independent of the measure, and you observe the same phenomenon in the best response. And so once again, you have the fact that alpha is linear in X with eta being the independent of the measure. So the only thing that depends on the measure is this zero order term in the feedback. This is this hatch. So what do you want to compute the optimal path? You have this very nice observation that the optimal trajectories, they have this shape that you see at the bottom line. So you recover this linear structure here with eta being dependent of the measure. And the only thing that depends on the measure is H. And H takes values in RD, if X takes values in RD. And certainly this is a way to expect for huge reduction of the complexity of the problem. Because if you have a look at the dynamics of capital X, 
if you know a little bit of probability or stochastic processes, this is a Gaussian process. What I mean by a Gaussian process is that, in particular, you see that the dynamics is forced by your ground motion, so this is Gaussian. And then here you just have a linear transformation of X. And so since Gaussian variables are stable by linear transformations, certainly it must be Gaussian. And this is a Gaussian process. So uh, any of these random variables, capital XT, these are Gaussian random variables. And it, it means that when you are looking for the fixed points, you are going, you are going to look for the fixed point in a much, much smaller space, which is the statistical model. This would be what we would say in statistics, the statistical model formed by Gaussian random variables. And so to describe a Gaussian random variables, there are only two things that I need, the mean and the variance. And so certainly it tells you that the fixed point will be much, much simpler to, uh, to compute. And so it will give you uh, simpler equations and a simpler analysis. So this is what I tell you here. Uh, this is a summary of what I have just said. So capital X is what we call a non stamp process. This is the, uh, the wording in, uh, in probability theory. And so this is a Gaussian process. So to be completely uh, precise, I should say that this is Gaussian conditional on the initial state of the population. So this is a bit subtle, but <laughs> in the case when X0 is random for sure, then this is not exactly Gaussian because X0 might not be Gaussian. But if X0 is deterministic, then this is clearly Gaussian. If not, you have to take the conditioning on, on X0. And even more, in fact, when you compute the variance of this process, this is an exercise that you can do quite simply. Uh, when you compute the variance, for sure, what you do is that you, you take the expectation in the equation and then you remove the expectation. And when you remove the expectation, you remove the hatch because hatch is completely deterministic at this stage. And so when you compute the variance, you see that the variance does not depend on hatch. And so it doesn't depend on mu. So in fact, this, the problem is even simpler. The only thing that is really, really unknown is the mean, or the only thing that you need to describe your, your fixed points is the mean of the population, the mean state. So this is a problem in which the data only depends on the mean state of the population. And you know that this structure is preserved by the optimization problem, meaning that the optimal trajectories themselves are Gaussian and the only unknown is the mean. So you have to make the fixed point on the mean. So you see that this is easier. So this is a way for you to say, okay, fine. This will be a simpler problem than what I did before. So now you, you have to perform the analysis. So what about this eta? Well, so eta, this is given what we call a Riccati equation. So this is a standard computation in, uh, in optimal control theory. When you solve a linear quadratic problem, uh, whether this is stochastic or, or deterministic, basically you face this kind of equation. And here, let's say that uh, everything is scalar. So eta is, uh, is a nice ODE. And once again, I can solve it exogenously. I can prove that since it derives from a convex optimization problem, there is no blow up in this equation. And so this is fine. Eta is given once for all. And now the question is, what about hatch? In fact, if you remember what we did or what we have been doing so far, we said that we described the fixed points by means of a forward backward system. And in the backward equation, now the unknown is hatch. And I'm just going to write down an ordinary differential equation for this zero order term hatch. And this will be the analog of the HJB equation, except that since the model is finite dimensional, because I was able to say that necessarily the unknown live in the space of Gaussian probabilities, I just have to describe the evolution of one parameter in RD. There is no need to solve a very complicated HAB equation. 
it suffices to have a look at the value of cash. And if you remember what we did yesterday and this morning, I spoke about the Pontryagin principle, when typically if you apply the Pontryagin principle here, you will get the ordinary differential equation that is satisfied by this term little h. The reason is, if you if, if this is not clear for you, the reason is is that the optimal feedback, as I told you, is exactly this one. So if I want to represent the optimal feedback by means of Pontryagin, certainly I will be able to get an equation for little h. So this is what you want to do. And so you get an ordinary differential <laughs> equation for little h. And this is a backward equation. This is a backward equation. In the sense that the boundary condition is just given by this quantity, which comes from the fact that in the cost, in the cost that you have in the uh, here, you identify uh, H with the double product that you obtain in the extension of the square. So this is of with the derivative, or I should say the zero order term that you get in the derivation with respect to little x of the cost, uh, the, this uh, terminal cost, or the sum for the running cost. So this is very, very easy to get an equation for little h. And so in the end, what you observe is that you can compute explicitly, or at least not explicitly, but you have an equation for little h, and back to the shape of the optimal feedback, you have these dynamics for the equilibrium or the optimal trajectory. And so the fixed point now is very, very easy. And for those of you who are in the, in the master program, maybe this could be also one example that you could put in your report if you want to really focus on one example. Maybe this one is the easiest one that we have studied so far. And maybe you can here, you can do all the computations that you want. And this could be a way for you just to check that um, you have understood well the global definition in the notion of fixed points, you should be able to, to reach this uh, this uh, forward backward uh, system of two ODEs. So this is in finite dimension instead of being in infinite dimension. So I insist on the fact that this is a very nice computation that you can do. So the forward equation is obtained here just by taking the expectation of X in this equation. So you take D of the expectation of X and since you want to identify the law of the optimal path <laughs> with mu t itself, when you take the expectation, this this should be mu bar because mu bar is the mean of mu, and mu is exactly the law of capital X. So mu bar should be the expectation of capital X. So once again, by taking expectation in this equation here, you should be able to recover this equation. So this is your system. And now you wonder about existence and uniqueness to this system. If you remember what I said yesterday about the characteristics of the Burgers equation, this is not that far. Burgers, this was mu bar is equal to minus h and h dot is equal to zero. So certainly this is a characteristic system that is very close to what we said yesterday about Burgers. And so we will face once again some uh, singularities or some non-uniqueness phenomena uh, if f and g are quite general and we will enforce uniqueness if f and g are required to be monotonous in uh, in some sense so this is exactly what i'm saying now uh, if you try to to revisit what i said yesterday about uh, the solvability of main field games if you want to apply cauchy lipschitz just in small time in terms of uh, hyperbolic equation, you are just saying that you don't have a singularity, but only in, in, a, in a small time close to the boundary. And this is what I'm saying now. The PDE that is behind, in fact, uh, you, should, you should think of it as a PDE. So the, the solution would, would be this little v. And the way you write down this little v is to say that patch must be a function of the mean. <coughs> I hope that this is quite clear to you that this is the same as what we did for the master equation. For the master equation, we said 
the solution to the HJB equation is calligraphic U of the state of the population. This was the definition. And here, this is the analog. But since you were able to reduce the dimension of the, uh, of the statistical model, the master equation becomes much, much simpler. And you see what is the master equation by expanding. So you say, I postulate this kind of relationship. I take the derivative in time on both sides. I know the ODE satisfied by H. I know the ODE that is satisfied by mu bar. I identify the terms sides, and I should be able to get this equation. So this equation, in fact, this is the master equation or a reduced version of the master equation in this very simple model. And so you say, well, this is a difficult equation because once again, there might be some singularities appearing. You can do this in dimension one, even in dimension one, this is, this is pretty interesting. If this is not in dimension one, you should pay attention that there should be some inner product uh, in the product uh, here. Okay, now, if you want to make the connection with the last Lyon's uniqueness result, you can check that F and G non-decreasing in the usual sense, in this setting, this is the same as saying that F and G satisfy the Las Reunions monotonicity property. So monotonicity here, since F and G only depends on the mean of the measure argument, this is the same as saying that F and G are non-decreasing in the usual sense. So this is another manner for you to re-understand the meaning of the Las Reunions condition in this very simple model. And once again, in the general setting, noise, I mean, you may lose uniqueness. And the last remark is to say that the presence of the noise W in my system, this was absolutely useless. The problem appears whether you have sigma is equal to one or sigma is equal to zero. This is the same equation and there is not, not, not an impact. So now the question is what happens if I put a common noise? I have, I discussed yesterday about the common noise and you saw that this was a bit difficult, but now I would like to go to revisit these questions in this simpler example. Here, it will be more understandable and by combining things that we are doing now with things that we did yesterday, maybe you will get a better picture. Okay, so the first thing is that I'm going to restart from the forward backward system, but I'm going to roll the mice this forward backward system. For the time being, I say nothing about the interpretation in terms of mental games. I will say that next. I'm just saying for the moment that I could take the same forward backward system, the two of these, but inside I put a noise. So what does it mean? It means that I put a noise epsilon db. Before this was eta db. Now this is epsilon db, but epsilon is a small intensity. And in the backward, in the backward equation, this is the same subtlety as yesterday. This was another motivation for discussing forward backward stochastic differential equations in the talk we had yesterday. When I randomize the forward equation, I should pay attention to the fact that in the second equation, in the backward equation, I want to preserve the fact that at a given time t, the solution is observable, which means that at a given time t, h middle t does not anticipate on the future of the noise. And I told you yesterday that basically there was a way to penalize the equation by means of a stochastic term such that there is a unique solution that is non-anticipative. This is the theory of backward stochastic equation that we mentioned yesterday. And so we end up with a couple of two equations, the same forward equation as before, and this backward equation but now this is stochastic, so that patch at time t is observable. And this is something that is absolutely necessary from the practical point of view. At a given time t, you must be able to compute, if you think of it, in terms of optimal feedback, you should be able to compute the realization of the optimal feedback given, uh, given the observation of the noise. So what is B here? Well, B, this is a new Brenner motion that is completely independent of the uh, of the previous Sagrana motion W. Now there is a result uh, 
that comes from the stochastic analysis, that in the presence of the noise, this system, provided that, let's say, F and G are continuous and bounded, well, this system is uniquely solvable just because of the presence of the noise. And the reason that you, you have behind, maybe I should say, let's say F and G a little bit more <laughs> continuous. I should say the Lipschitz continuous and down, just to be sure that this is fine. Um, if you think in terms of PDEs, if you are more on the PDE side, it means that when you do that, in fact, you put an additional Laplace in the Burgers equation. So you know that now you are, you are going to benefit from the smoothing effect of the Laplace and you get rid of the signal. If you're not PD specialist, but you, you come from a, a probability theory, um, the very good point is that if you put a noise, uh, basically you can make a case on of argument to remove patch here at the cost of modifying the backward equation, but this is a way to decouple the two forward and backward equations. Basically, this is the probability interpretation of the, of the results. Anyway, there is existence in the universe. And now you could say, well, does it mean something at the level of a midfield game? The fact that when I restore the presence of noise and force the presence of a noise, the fact that I get uniqueness, what does it mean for midfield game? Okay, so here, yes, this, this line, I'm sorry, this is what I, I was saying, uh, Lipschitz and Bandit, there is existence and uniqueness, and this is the same as saying that you put an additional Laplace term in the, in the equations. Now, for sure, you say, well, I'm coming back to my midfield game, but inside the mean field game, I put an additional epsilon dB in the dynamics. So you have to remember what we did or what we defined. Just to be sure that this is clear for everyone, this was our original model. And I plug, I insert an additional epsilon dB in the dynamics of a tag particle. But the good part here is that alpha is completely free. So this is my control. And I put now in the control dynamics, I put this additional epsilon dB. So this is this one. So this is this equation. And now I could say, fine, I'm going to regard D as a common noise. I say what I'm given new, that is possibly random. This is no longer a measure. Well, new is a measure, but new bar is no longer a measure. New bar is just a process taking values in RD. I'm going to say new is non-anticipative. So it is observable at time t if I know the realization of the noise up to time t. I minimize my cross functional. And what is the fixed point condition? If you remember what we did yesterday, we said in the presence of common noise, mu should be identified with the law of the optimizer d and d. But I don't care about mu itself. I care about the mean of mu. And so this is something that you know. If I take the mean of a conditional law, well, the mean is nothing but the conditional expectation of the random value. And so finally, this is a way for me to rephrase the results. This forward backward system that you have on the top lines with a noise inside, this is this complicated stochastic PDs that we discussed yesterday. I know that these were difficult objects, but now back to this simple setting, if you reformulate everything, you end up instead of these complicated SPDs, <coughs> you just end up with this stochastic forward and backward equations. And thus, because of the presence of the noise, this is uniquely solvable, which means that there is a unique solution, a unique mean field game, a solution to the mean field game in the presence of a common noise. Well, so you are, you are really happy with, with this result. So once you are here, you could wonder plenty of questions. For sure, you could say, well, this is only a a toy example, is it possible to complexify? This is certainly the first question that you, that you could wonder. In this regard, there is one first remark. You cannot expect 
very easily for a generalization of this. If you know a little bit of uh, the impact of a noise in stochastic analysis, you know that the reason why the noise helps for the certainty <laughs> is that it modifies. And it modifies because it visits sufficiently well the space or the state space in which you live. Here, the common noise is of dimension D, and your unknown, which is the mean of the probability measure, is also of dimension D. But in the general setting, this is not sufficient to know the mean of the measure. Here, this is sufficient because my model in the end is Gaussian. But if I have a very, very general model, I don't know where is the probability measure for the equilibrium. And if I just have a finite dimensional Brennan motion, certainly this is much, much too small to visit the whole space of probability measures and to get some spoofing phenomenon. So clearly, it's pretty clear that a common noise of this shape cannot be sufficient to address a general model. Anyway, this is one question. This is one question. And just to mention, and I will come back to this next in some references. A few years ago, I did a similar analysis by embedding a mean field game in L2 and putting a noise in L2. L2 is an infinite dimensional space, but we know what would be a, a nice uh, stochastic process with values in L2 with nice smoothing properties. And then indeed, you see that when you cheat, you don't work on the space of probability measures, but when you embed in L2, uh, possibly you can restore the weakness in a quite similar fashion up to some, uh, some changes. Anyway, another question that you can wonder is, well, what happens when epsilon tends to zero? After all, I could wonder about selection of some solutions to the original mean field game. This could be very, very natural. This would be a kind of vanishing viscosity method. And if you do so, you could also wonder whether this notion of selection could be directly done by coming back to the particle system, taking the limit, and is it possible directly to observe the same selection by working on the particle system? This very last question is the most challenging because I told you this morning, when we don't have uniqueness, well, we have these compactness arguments by Laker, tells you that you get in the end a kind of weak solution to mean field games, but there is no way to say which one you should put. <laughs> in terms of selection, the advantage of working with possibly with a common noise is that you separate the problems. You have taken first the mean field limit, and then you let the viscosity turn to zero. When you come back to particles, in fact, you are doing the same, the both, both things at the same time. The empirical measure is random, but the noise inside degenerates as k equal n tends to infinity. And at the same time, you have to take the mean field limit. So this is certainly more difficult. So passing first to the limit in the presence of a common noise and then letting the common noise turn to zero, certainly this is a way to separate the problem. Of course, you could wonder whether this is commutative in the sense that directly taking the limit n tends to infinity, you recover the same selection. Anyway, this is one possible result that you could wonder. So here, would it be possible to have selection? So this is one small question that you can wonder. I'm going to tell you that the answer is yes in this very, very simple example. And even more, I'm going to simplify a little bit, but in fact, we have the same results uh, with, uh, with exactly with the same result as before. So I take f is equal to zero and you see that in the cost that is here i remove the quadratic parts in the, in x squared i just take something that is linear but this is just for simplicity of the equation it is not a, it would not be a big deal with a, with a general uh, a general term as before with a quadratic uh, uh, term inside and when you rewrite the forward backward system without the common noise you get exactly this very simple equation. This was the motivation for me to use this, uh, this very, very simple structure in the cost coefficient. So what you observe is that this is exactly the system I mentioned to you before. So mu bar dot is minus h, 
and h dot is equal to zero. And at the terminal time, h t, which described or which should be the analog of the Hamilton Jacobi equation, this is g, uh, I'm sorry, this is not the, uh, g uh, bar, but this is g, this is a mistake, of mu bar t. And let's say that you start from zero. So the mean state of the calculation is zero, and you take this is an instance, you take g bar of x or g of x, I'm sorry. This is minus x between minus one and one. And after after uh, one, this is minus one and before minus one, this is one. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I have not a plot of this. I thought I had a plot, no, sorry. So this was in the, in the talk of yesterday. So this was the, the, same, uh, the same initial boundary condition as yesterday. This is constant equal to one. It decreases at right minus one. And then this is constant equal to minus one. And then you can compute uh, equilibria. And you observe this is a quite a simple computation that you can do. Or once again, for those of you who have to make this report, uh, it could be another simple computation that you could do. You characterize the uh, equilibria, and this is very easy. You observe that equilibria are obtained by solving this equation, capital A is G minus T capital A. Just because, in fact, what you say is that to solve this forward backward system, since h dot is constant, you call a to be the boundary value of h. So, in fact, it says that mu bar evolves with velocity minus a. And so, a should be equal to g of minus ta. So, this is the way you get this, uh, this equation. And then you realize that if you take <coughs> t too large, then indeed you have several solutions, which is exactly consistent with what I told you before. And for instance, you may find that minus one, zero, and one, these are, uh, these are uh, equilibrium. Okay. So now that could be among those three solutions, you could, you should say, or you would like to say, well, which one should be selected. There is one answer that, that could be interesting, but it is in fact, which is false, if you follow this uh, strategy based on vanishing viscosity. You could say, for any of these A, I compute the relative cost for my player in the population. So at the equilibrium, I am given a cost and I compute the cost. And maybe I would like to say, I'm going to minimize, I'm going to choose the cost with the smallest, or the, the, the equilibrium with the smallest cost. This is something that you can find in, the, in some papers in, in, in physics. Uh, people say, okay, uh, let us use uh, the, 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 or let us select the minimizer of the equilibrium with the that minimize the equilibrium cost. So you see that you recompute, so you replace G of mu, which is now A, so you compute what it is, and you see that you get exactly this, uh, this quantity. In fact, this answer is not good. You, you can see, you can observe that this is not the right answer, and I'm going to show you next that this is not consistent with the vanishing viscosity. So back to the vanishing viscosity. I put a viscosity as I did before, and so the forward backward system that I had, it becomes the randomized equation for the forward equation. And the backward equation, this is just to say that this is constant in expectation. This is what we call the Martin Jackson. And when I resolve this system, I know now by uh, the analysis I told you that this is uniquely solvable. And I can wonder about the behavior when the viscosity tends to zero. This is the same as saying that you take the Burgers equation with a small viscosity. Oh, I forgot the, uh, the second order derivative is here. So you take the, uh, you take here the, uh, the Burgers equation and you wonder about the asymptotic behavior of the characteristics. The characteristics, these are the solution to the stochastic uh, forward backward system. <coughs> and in fact, what happens is that when epsilon tends to zero, so these are your three equilibria, minus one, zero, and one. If you make the proof, you see that what you select are the extremal 
equilibria, the one that leaves as fast as possible the singularity. So this is what you, that you can do when you make the computation. Just one picture about, uh, about the proof. I will come back to the result if you want next. This is just a picture by Han to show you what happens really when you put Hans uh, in, the, in the computation. When you say, when you have a look at the stochastic trajectory, what happens is that in small time, it oscillates around zero under the presence of the noise. So this is back to the equation. This is the noise is dominating in small time. So you fluctuate a lot. But after some time, you have to remember that dBT is of the, the, the scale root of dt. So in small time, the root of dt is much, much greater than dt itself. So in small time, it's going to fluctuate around zero. But since epsilon is very, very small, after some point, you will see the impact of the drift of the of the optimal uh, of the equilibrium value of h. And what I tell you here is that, in fact, uh, this uh, this uh, optimal value. So you have to remember that this is it could be. Oh, this was a in the notation that I used before. So this was this uh, um, this a here. So what you see when you put a little viscosity is that the drift is going to push me. So let me move to sorry about this. Let me go. Yeah. I'm going to, to, to switch to this uh, to this picture. So when you are above zero, the impact of this uh, of this hatch is to push you at a velocity that is very close to one to push you upwards. So this is because of the fact that very close for a very small viscosity, the value of the velocity field is very close to uh, here to uh, or minus the, the <coughs> minus the solution of burgers is very close to one. When you are, when you are below zero, in fact, it, push, it pushes you towards the negative and the rate is very close to minus one. So once again, in very short time, the particle oscillates under the presence of the noise. And after some point, you start feeling the noise and the noise, when you are positive, pushes you far away from zero. And when this is negative, pushes you far away from zero. So somehow everything works as if you had a coin. You flip the coin. Either you fall in the positive, and then after some point, you feel the impact of the noise and you go at the rate plus one towards the positive, or you flip minus one, and then you feel the negative part of the, of the drift, and you, you go away from zero at rate minus one. And so this is exactly what you observe in this picture. Once again, in small time, you are very, very close to zero. You flip your coin. If you go to one, then you are attracted by the velocity field in the region where this is equal to plus one. And here, uh, this is the same, but by symmetry, this is minus. And so you don't stay in the neighborhood of zero. And this is uh, what you can predict as a uh, solution. You could say this is just an example. And is there any possible way to have a, a better explanation for this phenomenon? I mean, instead of doing the, the computations by hand, uh, is it possible to understand this principle in a more systematic manner? So this is one question. I can tell you that, in fact, if you come back to the particle system, you can prove that this is the same solution. This is much more difficult to prove. This one is not that difficult to prove. I mean, the picture that you have here, this is really the proof. Now, if you want to come back to the, the equilibria of the end particle system and prove that, in fact, when you pass to the limit, you really select these two equilibria, you can do so, but this is more demanding because, once again, you have to play at the same time with the degeneracy of the noise and the dimple limits. Okay, so this was one uh, one toy example where, where, where you can do uh, many, many computations. So part of these results come from uh, one paper of uh, one PhD student of mine, uh, Rinel, for them, 
so we did some restoration of uniqueness uh, for this toy model and also some selection results, uh, the one that I mentioned. As I told you, if you really want to see what could happen in infinite dimension, the problem is not, is not closed. I mean, there, there remain plenty, plenty of questions, but by destroying the main field structure of the game, by working on the email to spaces, you could prove some restoration of uniqueness results. I don't want to insist on this, but this is something that we, that we can do. And what I'm going to tell you next is that when the set space is finite, when the set space is finite, which is something that I have not spoken about so far, but I will speak about it, and this will be a way for you to revisit what we have done so far. The statistical model is also of finite dimension because the set space will be finite. And so possibly you can also do similar computations. Okay. And what about selection of equilibria? Trying to guess, to guess, not to prove, but to guess, why I have selected these extremal paths instead of doing in a, in a very complicated manner the computations by hand. Is, is there any way to guess of a general, uh, at least in some cases, a general uh, a procedure or a systematic procedure in a class of examples? So in the literature, so there was this paper uh, with uh, Vinel that I mentioned. And in fact, there, uh, there is a very nice paper by Alecos, uh, uh, Paolo Daipra, uh, Marcus Fischer, and, uh, and I forgot his first name, I told him not, I don't remember the first name. Um, this is for a set, a set space with two elements. So this one, I'm going to come back to it. So you will find some selection results for uh, Milton gaps. But the principle of all these models, all these models, is that they have a potential structure. And this is the key point. This is not clear when you have a look at the models that I presented, uh, but if you have a model, as I presented before in dimension one, when, when I did the selection, you saw that the selection was clearly based on the geometry of the space because I told you either I go up or I go down. Or when you have a set space that is equal to zero one, which means that the the simplex, the space of probability measure is of dimension one. In fact, this is potential. And if this is potential, it means that intuitively, there is an associated mean field control problem. If you remember what I said, uh, I think this was uh, yesterday afternoon, I told you that not only there are mean field games, but there are also mean field control problems. And I told you that if you have a look at the minimizers of the mean field control, then the minimizers are the solution, or are solutions, not the solution, but are solutions of, uh, of uh, a mean field game. And this mean field game is called a potential mean field game for the reason that there is a potential on the top of it, which is uh, the mean field factor. And in fact, the, the claim is that in those examples, what you should do is that you should select when you let the viscosity tend to zero, you should select the minimizer of the mean field control problem that is associated uh, to your mean field game. So let me just uh, show you one picture and then I'm going to come back in the very uh, last part of my talk with my numerical experiments to this, uh, to this picture. Uh, so this is, this is another instance. So you take the same model as before with D is equal to one. So there was no running cost, so CF was equal to zero. F is equal anyway to zero, uh, CG is equal to one, and GX is this very complicated uh, cos uh, 10 X with beta minus two beta. I don't care about the shape, this is just to have a nice picture of uh, the So let me remind you the, the shape of the, uh, of the problem uh, so that everybody uh, agrees. So this is exactly this mean field game where f is equal to zero, cf is equal to zero, g is this uh, complicated functional that I told you before, and uh, cg is equal to one, fine. And so what you uh, do next is <coughs> you, study, you study the shape of the Nash equilibrium. So here, this is a plot that should tell you what is the mean state of the population at terminal time. 
So the mean state of the population at terminal time in this example. So with, uh, I think this is for a well choice, uh, well chosen beta. I think it's a beta is a well chosen parameter so that I have nice uh, pictures. So on the left, the Nash equilibria. So they are located at the zeros of the blue line. So I think that this is, yes, this is the, the orange line is, uh, is zero. And so at the intersection between the orange line and the blue line, where you have the zeros of the blue line, if you go the, if you have a look at the axis R, then these are exactly Nash equilibria or more precisely, these are the mean states of the population at terminal time for the corresponding Nash equilibria. So here you see that you have on this plot, you have three equilibria. Okay, so this is uh, this is uh, one picture for this uh, for this set of parameters. This is something that you can do. Uh, you can solve. You have a look at the forward backward system exactly as I did before, and you solve by hand the system, and you realize that it, this must be the zero uh, of uh, of this curve. Now, what should be uh, what should be a potential gain for this one? I claim that there is a potential uh, a mental control on the top of this. So once again, I claim that this problem, this mean field gain, is potential, which means that there is a mean field control problem on the top of it. And when you do the computation, you realize that this is the cost functional that you have <laughs> the mean field control problem. So what is capital G here? Sorry about this. Capital G, where is my pointer here? Capital G, this is a primitive of little g. You can do uh, these computations by hand. You will check the definitions that I gave about, um, about a potential game, and you will check that when you have a look at the country again of this problem, this is exactly the mean field game that I mentioned. So you say you are going to minimize this cost functional over trajectories x that you see at the, at the bottom line of the slide, uh, this is a bad idea to use B as a gradient motion. Certainly, uh, W would be more adapted uh, given the, uh, the remarks that we had before. And so, this is an independent noise, not a common noise. And in the cost, I want to minimize, let's say, not exactly the variance, but the, the mean square of the of the terminal state, G of the mean of the terminal state, and the mean kinetic energy. So I want to minimize this. This is a mean field control for the simple reason that in the cost functional, you see a nonlinear function G acting on the expectation. This is a baby model, but this is a, a mean field control problem. And I claim that if you have a look at uh, the poultry idea of this, this is your mean field. Model. So you, you write down your first, your critical condition, your first order condition, and the critical points are solutions of your mean field. Models. And now, in fact, um, there is a way, <coughs> numerically, you can, uh, you can compute explicitly, in fact, the, the, the solution. And on the right pane here, I claim that the solution to the mean field control, their mean state at terminal time, is given by the minimizers the global minimizers, not the local minimizers, the global minimizers of what you have on the right hand side. So you see that what you have on the right hand side, you see that the global minimizer is here. This is around minus zero dot five. And so it corresponds to, uh, if I'm correct, this should be this one here. So if my guess is correct, it means that when I have a look at a mean field game with common noise with those choice of parameters. I have uniqueness. And if I decrease, if I tune the intensity of the common noise, I should select minus 0 0.5 as mean state of the population at terminal time. This is what it means. And this prediction, this should be a kind of systematic way to predict what should be the right physical uh, equilibria for mean field games for which there is a potential. If there is no <laughs> thing, this is a completely different story, and I think that uh, 
at this stage, there is absolutely no answer to this question. And I will show you next that this is possible to observe this numerically. So numerically, you will see in the very last slides of the lectures, an algorithm that we studied with the uh, students. We start from zero. Zero is an equilibrium. This is a bad equilibrium in terms of this prediction. And you will see uh, along the uh, numerical uh, simulation, you will see uh, the mean state of the population shifting to the left and finally reaching the one that is predicted by the theorem. Without using, uh, without using the potential as function, just using the, the shape of the of the data. Okay, let me just uh, see uh, what time it is. Okay, so 15, okay. Okay, so these are uh, some questions. Before I address this question of uh, numerics, so I will say, I will come back to numerical questions uh, just for the very last part of these, uh, of these lectures. I would like to mention that same questions are interesting for finite state spaces. And I think this is a very, uh, very interesting case, uh, plenty of questions, and this is something that I have not discussed so far. So what I mean by finite state spaces, and maybe uh, for some of you, uh, these are interesting because the models are simpler. They are not, uh, maybe they are not the most popular model, but you have a series of papers about it. And I think that the very first ones were uh, Diogo Gomez, Olivier Guéant, Olivier Guéant and his PhD uh, had some uh, uh, problems uh, on the finite state, uh, Diogo Gomez and Alain Densoussan also did as well. And uh, here uh, you have uh, uh, Charles, uh, Charles, who is uh, in the map, uh, knows these problems very well as well. What is the idea? You will see that uh, this will be quite simple. And so uh, before the break, uh, this will uh, this won't be uh, too technical. You have your players, but now instead of assuming that the particles take values in RD which is a big space, this is the Euclidean space, they just take values in a finite set. So when I say finite, it means that it can only take a finite number of values. And so I can denote by one up to D those values. And so, for instance, when I spoke about one result with zero one as state space, this was one result by Alecos, for those of you who know Alecos, it was a mean free game, for which the output or the, the position of a player was either zero or one, failure or success. And okay, so these are earlier results in, uh, in the field. Selection of equilibria when d is equal to two by Alecos. And one question is what about uh, a common noise? You will see that constructing a common noise for finite state uh, mean free games, this is uh, more difficult. And so uh, uh, Charles uh, did, uh, did one work in this direction. Anyway. For the moment, the very good point for me is that if you work on a finite set, the space of probability measures is pretty simple. This is something that you learned a long time ago. If I have a probability measure on a finite set, the only thing that I have to compute is the weight of any of the elements of the set. So probability of one, probability of two, or P1, P2, up to P, X, D. And the sum of it is one, and any of the weights is positive. And so uh, the correction is the simplex. This is a, a subset of dimension D minus one. This is finite dimensional. And so since this is dimension, finite dimensional, it, it means that possibly by using a common noise in finite, uh, taking values in finite dimension, maybe this would be possible to restore, to enforce uniqueness under the presence of the noise. Uh, very similarly as what I did before uh, for Gaussian models, which were also of finite dimension. Okay, so here, this is what I'm uh, saying here. I'm just saying that possibly you can do the same as what I did for Gaussian equilibria, but for gains setting values in a finite set, just because this is finite dimensional. So certainly uh, this is easier. Right? So when you, you want to have smoothing phenomena, uh, and, and the simple fact that this is a finite dimension should be, should be uh, very helpful. Okay, but before the break, let me explain to you the way it works uh, without common noise, and then we will see uh, some possible extension after the break. <coughs> okay, so when you work in, uh, in a finite, uh, on a finite set, so 
your particle. So here, this is, I'm, I'm describing the mean field gain itself. So I'm directly at the limit when I take the tag or representative player or reference player in the population. So X is the reference particle. And so it's going to jump from uh, state to state. And so uh, this is typically jumping according to a, a Markov process. So what does it mean? If you don't know very well what it means, uh, this is not that difficult. Uh, you take a collection of rates. So this is a matrix of rates. And so you see that alpha ij is the element ij of this matrix. And this is a time t. And so the probability to jump from i to j in a very small time is proportional to dt if j is not equal to i. So you really make a jump. So somehow you think of you throw a coin. Uh, and uh, the, the, the probability of success is very small. And the probability is proportional to the length dt. And the coefficient that you have in front of this, this is precisely alpha i j, so the, the rate at which you, you jump. And so you require alpha ij to be uh, positive, and the larger this, uh, the, the, the more likely you are to jump. And now, for sure, you may stay. You may stay in i, and so with a very very big probability in small time, but you stay uh, where you are, and the probability is one plus alpha i i, which is in fact one minus the rates of the others times dt. So you jump. OK, and here I'm going to say that you control. This is the simple model. I'm not saying that this is a general model, but this is the, the very first model that people used in the, in the midfield games for uh, with a finite, uh, finite set. What you control is precisely the intensity or the rates. You control the rate. You are going to tune the rates. This is a kind of velocity, and you are tuning the, the rates of jumping from one state to another state. What would be the Fokker Planck equation? Very easy. Uh, you compute the probability of being in, uh, in position i. And uh, for those of you who know Markov processes, this is easier. But if you take the probability of being um, in i, so, so the derivative of this, it solves an ordinary differential equation. So what it's going to, to do is that you receive masses from location j's from which you are you have jumped to i. So here you pass from j to i, and so the mass that was in j has jumped to i. And for sure, when j is equal to i, you lose some mass if you exit. If you exit. Um, if you leave where you are. So this is qi alpha i i. This is exactly the mass that you have lost because you jump from i to another state. So this is your focal point equation. And now you say, I am given p. p is the analog of mu. I use p because this is the usual notation for the weights of the probability measure. It describes the statistical state of the rest of the population. I, have one, I am one player in the population. I might not be in the same states, statistical state as, as the others. And the others, they obey or they live according to some statistical distributions, which are described by some PT or P of S. So this is the same as before, mu. But this is very, uh, uh, this is uh, simpler because now P is just a, a finite uh, dimensional vector. I, I just have to say what is. How many, or how many, what is the proportion of players in set one, how many in set two, and so on. So this is exactly a P for proportion. And the cost functional, there is no longer an expectation because to simplify, I have written the expectation as uh, uh, a sum because the model is finite. So this is the probability for X to be in set I times the cost G when X is equal to I. And so the probability is qi, and so I have the sum over this quantity. These are my running costs, or my terminal costs. And here, this is the running cost. And here, this is a kind of kinetic energy. Uh, I want to minimize the square of the rates, as otherwise I could have a very, very large rates. And I do the same as before. I say, well, p is the input. I want to minimize. 
So minimize the cost when Q solves uh, this, uh, this equation. And I want to take a fixed point. So I want to find P and an optimal control such that I have the identification that PI is equal to the law of uh, the minimizer, of the optimizer. So this is the same fixed point as before, except for the fact that this is reformulated for gains with a finite set. Okay, so this, uh, this was the missing slide. Um, so this is just to tell you what the forward backward system, so the Hamilton Jacobi equation and the Fokker Planck equation become, but I told you already about the Fokker Planck equation. So now the question is about Hamilton Jacobi. So this is the equation for the value function. So when you want to compute the optimal cost given the environment. So this is how much you have to pay till the end of time. So you will start from a little time t, little t here, and i is your state. And you see that this is simpler than what I had before, because before this was a PD, now this is an OD. This is an OD because x is no longer an element of i, <laughs> it's just in a finite set. So I have this equation just finite, uh, finite number of times. And this is one of the reasons why mental games with a finite set are really interesting is that the equations become somewhat simpler. So, so uh, makes sense to. So what I was saying is that, so this was the missing slide. And now you have, uh, you have the Hamilton Jacobi equation. And you see that this is no longer a PDE, but this is, I'm sorry, I'm just looking for my pointer. Uh, this is here. Uh, so this is the, this is this equation. And this is no longer a PD, but this is not an <laughs> ID functional equation. So UIT, this is what I was saying to people, uh, people in the room. This is the cost that you have to pay till the end, uh, starting from location I or from site I. And so this is, um, there are just uh, finitely many sites. So you have just a finite number of ODs. So this is a, a big, uh, a big system of ODs. So this is where I start. Uh, and now let me come back to the description for all of you. This is the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian, remember that you have to minimize the action of the derivative, but this is now a discrete derivative of the value function onto the rates. And you want to minimize uh, the, uh, this plus uh, the kinetic energy. And when you minimize, you have to, to remember that uh, the, um, the rates have to be non-negative. And so when you compute, this is not a big, big uh, difficulty, you realize that in fact, this minimizer here, let me check if this is correct. Uh, I think that the end of race is not, is not well, uh, is not well placed. Uh, the sum, I'm sorry, the, the end of race should be, um, This is this minimization here, this minimization here, that is equal to what you have in blue. But uh, uh, there should be a cut here in the uh, in the brace, and uh, uh, so this is the the, the the output of this uh, of this minimization. Anyway, you see that this is a nonlinear equation in U i, which is quite simple, and now this is coupled with the forward equation, which is the, the same Fokker Planck equation as before. You have here the, the shape of the Fokker Planck equation. And in fact, this is what you have in black here. This is the optimal strategy or the optimal transition, right? So this is exactly the same as what you have here. And this is obtained by um, exactly by the same computation as the one you use <laughs> for obtaining the Hamilton. So this is the forward backward system. Once again, uh, you can try to do that if you're interested, trying to reprove existence of a solution by means of a compactness argument. This is much easier than what I did yesterday because now the, uh, the probability measures live in a finite dimensional set. So for shadow argument, maybe this is easier. This would be also something that you could try to do as an exercise or one simpler case 
for which you could uh, try to write it down the proof. Uh, as for uniqueness, uh, we also have the analog of monotonicity. Um, this is the shape, so it means that if you take FIP minus FIQ, acting on PI minus QI, then the sum of this has to be number. So this is the usual background for uh, games with uh, a finite or on, on a finite set. And, uh, and then uh, the philosophy is pretty similar, except that the equations are, are certainly simpler. Now back to the program, I just would like to emphasize this, uh, this point next, is that you would like to randomize. You would like to randomize in order to uh, restore uh, or to enforce uniqueness. And now it becomes a more difficult question because the meaning of a common noise is more difficult uh, to, to understand. On the, for games with uh, a continuous state space, well, so far we just have added uh, additive, uh, additive noises and this was pretty easy to do that. Now when the state space is finite, you cannot just say, I'm going to add a grand emotion, it would not make sense. And so there are several strategies to, uh, to have a, a common noise on the space for a minfield games on a finite set. And here, what I'm going to tell you is one of these, this is one instance that we described with Alekos and also uh, uh, Berakhtar and uh, Cohen in Michigan University. Um, and this was in a recent work when we proved that it was able indeed to enforce uniqueness by means of this type of Fokker Frank equation. I'm going to describe this next, but a bit of bibliography. If you're interested in minfield games on a finite set with a common noise, there was a very nice paper by Bertucci, Lassery, and Lyons. And they give a kind of general uh, strategy to get a common noise, which is to randomize the whole population not to randomize, I should say to, to, to have um, a, a transformation on the whole population at random times. So this is this was exactly the construction. You say at random times, for instance, a, a kind of a, a Poisson process, uh, you have um, a global transformation acting on the population. So you, you may rearrange the, 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 the labels of the, of, the, um, of the particles, for instance. This could be a lot. Um, here, this is a bit different. Here, the, the way I'm going to construct the, the common noise is, is a bit different. We have, from time to time, a global randomization of the state of the population. This is, this is a bit different. So this is, uh, this manifests in the form of this uh, new Fokker-Planck equation. The very difficulty of randomization, when you want to randomize the Fokker-Planck equation, is that you want the solution to remain with values in the simplex. And this is difficult because the simplex is just, a, this is a D minus one dimensional open subset. And if you want to, to, uh, to put a noise on this, uh, somehow the risk is that somehow you, you go outside, outside the, the simplex. And so what we did in this, uh, in this approach is that we put this type of noise, this is the red part here, and this is a noise that is inspired from uh, population genetic models. Uh, this is the right Fisher model. And the very good point of it is that if you take QI that is equal to, uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, Q that is equal to, to P. I'm uh, sorry, I don't see that here. Uh, if you take, no, this is QI, I'm sorry, this is not QJ, I'm sorry about this. This is QI. If you take QI that is equal to PI in this equation, so if you force QI that is equal to PI in this equation, then the solution to the equation, this is a stochastic differential equation, and it remains <coughs> with values in the simplex. So P is regarded in this equation as the state of the population. Q is regarded as the Fokker Kant equation for the tagged particle. Now, when you identify the law of the tag particle and the state of the population, you get Q is equal to P. And this equation, when Q is equal to P, basically it stays with values in the simplex. But the very difficulty of it is that when Q is not equal to P, the solution stays positive, but this is not with values in the simplex. The sum of the Qs might be larger than one. In fact, the only thing that you have 
is that in the mean expectation, the expectation of the Qs remains equal to one. We know how to interpret this in terms of a monthly game or games on a finite number of particles, but I'm not going to do that. You have to play with the fact that the only thing that you, you know is that the expectation of the sum of the Qs is equal to one, but when you remove this expectation, expectation being taken on the Ws, then indeed we know that this is equal to one, so the mean mass is equal to one, and this, is, this suffices uh, to, to, to address uh, a variant of a mean polygon for which uh, the, 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 the Fokker point equation of one player is exactly this one. But this is not my main purpose for the, uh, or my main uh, message for the rest of this uh, discussion. So what I want to stress is that if you assume that this is, it describes a kind of Fokker point equation for one particle, you can minimize exactly the same cost as before. So you want to minimize exactly the same cost as before, except that now you have an expectation in front of the hole, and this expectation <laughs> is related with the noise W that you have. And now you say, I'm going to minimize the cost over the dynamics Q, and then I want to identify Q with P. This would be the fixed point. And this fixed point should be the solution to the mean field game with a common noise. So this is what I'm going to write down next. You want to find a minimizer such that P is equal to the minimizer, or the minimizer is equal to P itself. So in the end, you find P and the, and the optimal control such that P is equal to the minimizer. So this is the usual a fixed point condition in mean field games. And so this is the, the Fokker point equation that you have at the equilibrium. And so for those of you who know the right fisher dynamics, the right fisher model in population genetics, this is very related. If you have a look at the part in red, the local uh, variance or the bracket of it is exactly given, it's exactly of the same nature as the right fisher model in population genetics. And this was one of the motivation, in fact, for this model, we wanted to use uh, the same types uh, of uh, the same type of, uh, of noise. So in the end, when you minimize, you also have to, you need to, to have a look at the value function exactly as we did yesterday. So this was this difficult computation that we had yesterday when we had this SPD system combining the stochastic Fokker Planck equation and the stochastic Abington Jacobi equation. I remind you of the fact that the backward equation was stochastic once again. We had the Hamiltonian, this is exactly this one, as before, the running cost. And if you remember what we did yesterday, there was a martingale or a stochastic correction for forcing the solution to be non-anticipative. And I told you that there was a correction because of the verification argument where you combine the stochasticity of the value function and the stochasticity of the, um, of the dynamics, of the equilibrium dynamics. So this is your Hamilton-Jacobi equation. And the optimal rate for this variant of a mean field game is exactly given in terms of the same function of the same transformation as in the case without common noise. So just to say, you, you can forget the, the precise formula, but just to say that it works exactly in the same manner. And what you do is that you end up with this backward stochastic equation and forward equation for the state of the population. And now you might wonder again whether the presence of the common noise forces, forces uniqueness. And this is one result that we obtained. And the answer is not exactly yes, but this is not that far from being positive, and you will see that. But before I tell you the result, maybe you can write down, if you want, you can write down the analog of the master equation. This would be a second order master equation on the space of probability measures. So you would really, really see second order derivatives in the direction of the measure. So this is just to practice. The master equation is to say that you are looking for calligraphic U. This was before of X. Now I have put X as being Y, as being I. This is the state, the state of my player. So this is a site in the set uh, E. And I want to express the solution to the HAB equation in terms of this calligraphic U acting on the state of the population. This is exactly the same principle. And 
if you play with the same argument as yesterday, uh, you try to, uh, um, let's say that for instance, you, you use the dynamic programming principle, you expand. This is easier because now this is no longer on the space of probability measures. This is just on the space of the finite dimensional syntax. <laughs> so the derivatives that you have in this equation, basically, well, these are standard derivatives. So there is no, no big difficulty. And in black, in this equation in black, this is the master equation in black. Only in black, this is the master equation for the game without the common mouse. So you see that this is really a first order equation. In fact, this is a system of, high, of first order equation. So really, this is another point of view on the, on the master equation. You see that now this is a system of first order equation and the system is indexed by the site here, so uh, by uh, the label i, and i is an element of the set. In the master equation that we had this morning and yesterday, the sides or the element of the set space were denoted by x, and x was living in a continuum. So somehow the mean for the game, uh, the master equation was an infinite dimensional system that was parameterized by x living in the continuum. Now you can do, uh, again, this is a quite easy computation that you can do you to compute this master equation by using a standard derivatives. There is no need of Wasserstein derivatives. So if you want to do this computation, you can do that. And the argument is really the same. You expand the, uh, either you use the dynamic programming principle or even maybe even simpler here, you expand the both, both sides in this formula. You write DUIT and you write D of this quantity. You use the chain rule. And you identify both sides, and then you should get you should get the equation. So really, this is this is I think an exercise that um, that you have to you can. Do. Um, and the red terms, uh, these are the impact of the common noise. And now you see at the level of the PDEs what is the impact of the common noise. You get second order derivatives in the direction of in the direction of the measure. And we are really this is a pretty simple to, to visualize the, the meaning of this. And somehow, if you want to, if you wonder about the uniqueness, a possibility, the uniqueness of the main field game, a possibility is to wonder about the presence of a, or the existence of a classical solution to this master equation. If the master equation has a classical solution, then it works. If you remove the noise, uh, basically this is the end. Uh, Except if uh, if f and g are monotonous, as I told you before, you won't be able to say anything about uh, about the existence of a classical solution. But now you say, well, maybe when there is the noise, uh, especially this uh, this second order derivative here, uh, maybe I will be able to uh, have a classical solution and then to restore and to enforce units. So this is really the the strategy that we use. Now this is analysis. You have to prove that there is a classical solution. And this is not easy. This is not easy because even though you have second order derivatives, and you think of the Laplace, there is a smoothing effect, you see that you have this very bad term in front of it. I'm not going to, to enter the details, but this term, this is a way, or it comes, it comes from the shape of the noise, this right Fisher noise that I put. You have these very, very strange terms here, the root of pi, pj. In fact, these are terms that are used to ensure the fact that the solution is not going to be the simplex. You see that when pi is, it tends to zero, well, the diffusivity uh, is uh, smaller and smaller. So this is a way to avoid uh, the, the solution to, uh, to leave the simplex. And At the same time, it gives me uh, some degeneracy in the operator. So when PI gets smaller and smaller, uh, certainly I will have some degeneracies. The noise tends to zero or equivalently, uh, I observe some degeneracies in the, uh, in the diffusions. So this is more difficult at the level of the analysis because uh, really uh, this is not the usual theory for second order PDEs uh, that are uniformly parabolic. It's not uniformly parabolic, uh, basically. Uh, because close to the boundary of the syntax of the space of probability measures, you observe some degeneracies. Okay, so what we did, maybe I don't want to enter too much in, into the detail because as otherwise this will be complicated. 
just I want to to emphasize what what we did uh, just to to show you that we can do other things about restoration of of forcing uniqueness. So this is the same uh, the same uh, master equation. In fact, this is the same master equation in black. You have the same, but you have a red term. If you just have the black terms, we are not able to prove the existence of a classical solution. We don't know if there is, but we were not able to prove that. The reason is that this is not only, I mean, there is not only the, the diffusion, but there is also the nonlinearity. And the nonlinearity is difficult. And the existing results that we know about the smoothing properties of this operator. So there is a, there are some uh, some results which are not uh, so uh, so old. Uh, these are results in the in the, around ten years ago about the smoothing properties of these operators. There is a, a kind of shadow theory for these uh, for these operators. But the results that we know are not enough uh, to to treat or to modify uh, nonlinearities of this kind. Uh, meaning, when you solve a nonlinear equation, you need for actually <laughs> estimate that are independent of the smoothness of the nonlinear term that you have here. And so what we had to do is to modify a little bit the equation using this additional function phi, which says that when epsilon is given, you push a little bit the players when the mass, the mass, is too close to zero. So when the mass is close to zero, there is a kind of kick that automatically um, is going to increase the mass of, of, of a given state. So once again, let me repeat myself. So if pi uh, here is very is very small, which is very bad for the uh, for this uh, for this operator, then this function phi is a way to force in the dynamics some jumps so that the mass in i in the system is going to increase so this is a way to uh, to leave the boundary and we just do that locally very close to the boundary and this is a way to enforce uniqueness so this was the the, the result that i wanted to point out i'm not claiming that uh, i gave you the details but i'm saying that if you just put this little kick close to the boundary then you enforce uh, the existence of a, of a classical solution and the fact that the, the, the kick is, uh, is just uh, put locally, it makes possible the analysis of selection, as I told you before. So you can try to let the viscosity and the kick uh, tend to zero uh, to see whether you can select a solution uh, at least for potential gain. So this is something that we studied as well, but I'm not going to enter the details. So this paragraph was two motivation. There were two motivations. The first one, I wanted to say a little bit of things about games with a finite set, so you can forget about, forget about the common noise if you don't like it. But if you want to do uh, some exercises, you redo some of the computations. When the set is finite, recover the master equation without common noise, recover the HGBZ equation and the, the forward backward system. I think that these are things that you can do. Now, just to go to push further, I wanted to tell you in this setting, which is also a finite dimension, the simplex is finite dimensional, we can restore, we can enforce uniqueness by means of a common noise. So this was uh, in, uh, in line with uh, uh, what I told you before in the toy example with Gaussian equilibrium. Okay, now to conclude uh, these, uh, these lectures, I'm going to address another question, uh, but this is still connected with the, with the question of common noise. So uh, this is the question of learning. Um, so selection, you, you will find some result of selection in the slides, but I think this is uh, this was too much for this uh, for this lecture. So I don't know uh, how much time I have. Yes, so, so we have uh, uh, 30 or 45 minutes at most. But uh, let's discuss a little bit about learning. So learning means the way that you can learn an equilibrium. Learn meaning the way you can reach an equilibrium. So when you are given uh, people. Uh, how they could uh, reach by playing the strategies iteratively uh, reach an equilibrium there is no reason why an instantaneously uh, a system could be uh, playing a Nash equilibrium so how can you observe the formation of a Nash equilibrium by playing uh, successive strategies 
And in fact, when I say this learning, this is also a kind of iterative procedure to approximate an equilibrium, either from a numerical point of view, if you know your coefficients, but also from a statistical point of view. So this would be statistical learning. If you just have some data and based on this data, you want to learn an equilibrium. This is part of the, of the, of things you have in reinforcement learning. You are given a game or, or a control problem. You are given some data and based on this data, you want to find uh, the best, uh, the best action that you have to follow. So this is exactly what you do in statistical learning. So I'm not going to touch uh, any, uh, any, uh, any statistical learning question here. I want to give you the main lines for approximating the solution of an equilibrium. This is what I call learning by saying that this is, you should think of it as repeating some strategies so, so that in the end you have reached an equilibrium. And then I will show you that possibly you can put this learning procedure in the machine and observe some phenomena, as I mentioned you before, uh, those uh, selection phenomena that I spoke about. So this is what I told you. Uh, you want to learn an equilibrium, and then next possibly you put this uh, either in the form of a numerical method or some uh, some learning uh, statistical learning methods if you just have some observations. So this is the very uh, general procedure that you should think of. Uh, uh, for uh, learning, so for approximating, I should say, maybe this is better for approximating uh, the solution of an infinite. So there are things that you have. You have your state of the population. This is your environment. Okay. So this is the red box, <coughs> the green box. And in the yellow box, you have one reference particle in the population. This is the one that you are tracking in the population. Now in gray, you have what I'm going to call a black box. This is where you optimize, you optimize the state of the yellow player when you are given the green state of the population. If you know the coefficients of your problem, you do that numerically, for instance, to solve HJB. Now you need a solver for HJB, but maybe you can put this, put this in the machine and then you find numerically the optimal feedback. If you don't have the coefficients, you just have some data, your black box means that this is statistical learning. You are given the environment and uh, some observation for some actions of your, uh, of your player. Uh, then uh, how do you get uh, by uh, some uh, algorithm, learning algorithm, how do you get the best action given the green environment? Okay, so this is what I call the black box. You can put, you can put many things in this black box depending on your uh, on your setup. What I want as an output of the black box is the optimal state given the environment or precisely the low of the optimal state. So maybe you can see very well. I want to get or to reach an equilibrium. So certainly I should think of an iterative procedure. So I have an environment I'm going to tune the yellow box, the, the, the yellow player. I put this in the black box after some procedure, which can be uh, pretty long. Uh, I get the output, <laughs> which is the optimal state given the environment. And then I want to update, given the output here of the black box, I want to update the state of the environment and redo it again. And I hope that in the end, I will learn an equilibrium, a solution to the energy. So generally, this is, you are looking for a kind of iterative procedure for approximating a solution to your mean data. So the question is, what does update mean? So this is really the question, what do you mean by updating? So you want to find the solution of, a, of your fixed point. So I remind you of what we did yesterday. You are given your input in green, you solve so this is the same slides or these are the same slides as yesterday. You solve uh, the optimal control problem. And when I say that you update, it means that you want to use as an information, the output of the black box. So I remind you that yesterday we said 
a solution of a mean field gain is a fixed point to this equation. So mu has to be equal to the law of x mu of x star mu. So mu has to be equal to phi mu. So phi is the mapping for which we want to find, for which we want to, to get a fixed point. And so we want to use phi <coughs> of this uh, update based on phi uh, in the in the approximating procedure. The question is, in practice, uh, which updates do people use? The one that doesn't work is Pika, because I don't have contraction. In fact, what Pika would be, it would be to say, you have your state new n. You optimize the yellow player using the black box. You see the output. This is mn plus one. And you update the new state of the population by using mn plus one. This is really Picard. It fails. And it fails numerically, not only theoretically. We are not able to prove convergence. This is not a big surprise because if we have were able to use the prove convergence, certainly I would have proved my results by using contraction arguments. But numerically, you observe that it fails. Mm -hmm. So, what people do? The problem with Pika is somewhat you are too ambitious. When you update, you completely uh, rearrange uh, the state of the population. So, one solution, but you see, you will see that it, it doesn't work in, in, in any cases. This is to be uh, very, very less ambitious. So, when you update the state of the population at time n plus one, you just make a very small step. So, you see, you use the output of the black box. This is mn plus one. And you update the state of the population with a step of size one over n. This is what people call in game theory fictitious play. And Cardaliaghi and uh, one of his students, they studied the convergence of the fictitious play for mean field gains. So using exactly this rule as a date. So uh, let me, by the way, uh, say there was a uh, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, so uh, the, the PhD student of uh, Pierre was uh, at Vicanlu, and so they, they did uh, two, one or two papers, at least two papers, I think, on this question. And then other people use, so uh, the study in the papers by Pierre and his student, this was a theoretical study. And then uh, people from the uh, uh, numerical side, uh, they started uh, to, to implement numerically this method to see what it gives. And so you have a very nice papers by Francesco Silva, uh, uh, Romuald Deli and Mathieu Laurier. Uh, they did the similar things. Francesco is more on the numerical side, and uh, Romuald and Mathieu uh, they started to do things really uh, with uh, statistical learning. So they, they, they combined this procedure with uh, um, reinforcement learning method where you just have data uh, to compute the output of the data. So I'm not going to discuss about this, but the idea is to combine uh, all this uh, in the analysis or in, in the implementation of, uh, of the fictitious play. The very big problem of the fictitious play is that it works, but only uh, in some cases. So there is one case when it works, this is uh, the potential gain. So for potential gain, it works. And also for monotonous, uh, in the monotonous setting. Outside, there are no. Uh, no theoretical study. Anyway, what I would like to do uh, to, to finish is, uh, is to explain to you things that we have just been doing with uh, one of my PhD students. This is a way to use common noise, possibly numerically. After all, in the very, uh, in the very simple toy example that I showed you, common noise was able to modify the solutions. Because I told you what, what common noise is going to do is that it's going to help me to visit the probability space. In my example, this was just the space of the means of the measures. But numerically, maybe this is also a way to visit the space. And so maybe to learn or to explore the, the, the solution. 
and maybe this is this is very helpful from a numerical point of view. So these are things that we that we did. We tried in the third example only. We don't know how to do that in a very general uh, very general case for sure. But I will show you some results. Next. So what we wanted to do is that to say, well, we are going to play the same fictitious play, so the same updates, but we also randomize the state of the tag player so that we <coughs> randomize the state of the population. And by randomizing the state of the population, we expect to benefit from the action of this common noise. We call this exploration. This is a way to explore uh, the space of solutions. So this is what I call here. Uh, this is exploration. Okay. So, and the question is, does it for the for the analysis? Okay. I know that there are some some equations left on the board, but don't worry. Uh, this is the same setting as before, and I, I hope that this won't be uh, too technical. So I remind you of. Uh, of the toy model that I, I explained to you in the very first part of this uh, last lecture. This was my cost functional quadratic in X here for the thermal cost, for the running cost, the kinetic energy. And here I have F of the mean state, G of the mean state. And so what is M bar N? Uh, well, this is, the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not very, uh, I should have used new bars as a notation. This is the the mean, uh, or this is the the state of the environment, the green box, uh, as uh, at the iteration number n. So you assume that you have done uh, n times the previous iteration, and so this is uh, this is what you have as a proxy for the uh, uh, for the equilibrium. And now I put a common noise in the dynamics. So you could criticize because you could tell me I am changing the model. In fact, in the end, what you can do is to regard this common noise as a randomization of alpha. You discretize the derivative db. <laughs> and in fact, epsilon db, you could say that this is a way to randomize the action. So you could regard this as the same model but when I play a strategy, in fact, I corrupt this strategy by a common noise. This is exactly the same here. And this is a way to think that you don't really change the model. This is a way in the model to corrupt the actions by a common noise. If you do that, you compute, and this is what I told you before, you compute the best response. Uh, so this is the minimizers when you are given your uh, your strategy uh, when you are given the environment and then you update and you, up you update by using uh, the rule from the fictitious play so m bar m plus one the new environment this is one small step and this small step is given by the response or by the solution to this forward backward system so this is the same as before for the toy example except that inside here in f and g you put the proxy at the iteration number n, and then you have uh, you have uh, n divided by n plus one. So this is exactly the fictitious form. Question: Does the presence of the noise help? The response is no. At this stage, uh, it is not helpful. If you do the analysis, uh, we cannot use, in fact, uh, the noise in a better way. Uh, I forgot to put an epsilon here. There's an epsilon. Um, I'm sorry, here this was epsilon, and so here this would be epsilon as well. Okay, so what we did uh, is that we used um, we used Gersonov transformation. So Gersonov transformation is a way in probability to play with the presence of the knots. Uh, this is something that I told you before once. You can remove or subtract, or remove or add the presence of a DT term in the forward dynamics just by transforming your probability measure. What does it mean? It means that if you restart from your dynamics in black, here you put your additional common noise, 
in fact, I can correct by something that is that contains the output at the previous iteration. And so what is HM at the previous iteration? This is in the shape or in this forward backward system, this is the value of the backward equation. So if you remember the shape of the optimal feedback, this was the zero order term in the optimal feedback. I told you when you have this game, this one, the very nice point with this game is that the optimal feedback is linear. I don't care about the part uh, that is a linear coefficient, but the zero order term, this is H, this is the one that you have here. And so I can compute this one at any iteration of, uh, of the procedure. And so when I do my iteration number n plus one, I can say, well, I'm going to curl up the noise in red here by the previous proxy for the zero order term in the feedback. Okay, you say, well, it seems strange. It means that in fact, what we are postulating here is that intuitively, instead of using the same common noise at any iteration, we should change and adapt the common noise at any step of the iteration. This is exactly the, 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 the philosophy that is behind. And so this is not a grammar motion, but what Gersanov theorem says is that if you change a little bit your probability measure, so you multiply by your density, this is the, this density. So for probability, for royalist, this is something that is very well known. <laughs> for people from PD, this is a bit more subtle, but this is the spice of the Brunner motion. Somehow, Gersanov theorem it says that when you perturb a Brunner motion by something that is, uh, um, that is, uh, let's say, differentiable in time, and this is in, uh, in H1, in fact. Uh, this is again a grammar motion under a new probability measure that is absolutely continuous with respect to the original probability measure. So you know that up to a change of measure, and this new measure is obtained by a density that is explicit, the, the tilted or the shifted grammar motion is also a grammar motion under the new probability. Measure. So this is really a one core result in probability theory, and this is exactly the one that we are using here. So I'm saying that under this new probability measure, so whatever the shape of it, the probabilist know this very well, if you don't need to forget it, under a new probability measure, this noise here, this is a Brunner motion. So it makes sense. We are using another Brunner motion, somehow, another noise, but in low, it behaves in the same way. This is what matters, because under the new probability measure, we still have a noise that is a Brunner motion. Okay, and then, if you do this, it works. You observe that for this model, you observe that the algorithm converge, converges and you can prove convergence. So very few words and, and then I, I, I will stop. Why does it work? It works because in the forward equation at stage n plus one, so you have the optimal feedback and I told you that the optimal feedback was linear. So <coughs> Eta, which was the solution of my Riccati equation, Mn plus one, which is the solution itself. And you have the zero order term, which is Hn plus one. And thanks to my Gersonov transformation, I remove Hn. And so the, the two terms that are here, in fact, they are really, really close. And somehow what I'm doing is that numerically, or algorithmically, I am decoupling the forward equation from the backward equation. You see that. If things converge, if, if this works, certainly this difference, the step here should be smaller and smaller when n tends to zero. So the forward equation should be decoupled from the backward equation and then decoupling the two equations. This is exactly what I want to do in here. So it would work, it should work. This is the reason why uh, intuitively uh, the method uh, should work. Let me remove the computation. And this is the result that we have in the end. When you, you compute uh, at level M, after N iteration, uh, your, uh, your proxy for the state of the population and your proxy for the, uh, for the shape of the optimal feedback under the new probability measure, this is at distance one over N. 
in a Wasserstein sense. So this is a one a Wasserstein distance uh, between the laws that you have learned and here this is the solution to the mean field gain with an epsilon common noise. So this is the distance between the two distributions. This is one over n. So you get convergence and without monotonicity on, on the coefficients. So here, little f and little g, so the coefficients that we have here, there is no need to have them being monotone. So it works just because of the presence of the noise. Mm -hmm. And when you let the noise come to zero, so when you, re you really put epsilon, here this is with epsilon that is equal to one, when epsilon comes to zero, you see the impact of the noise, for sure the rate gets uh, worse and worse. Okay, so this is to say the impact of the noise numerically. Um, no, may, let me let me remove this and let me make some show you some numerical experiments just to show you uh, uh, things that we did. So we put this uh, in the machine. So whatever exactly the way we we coded this, and uh, here this is just to show you that um, there are two. These are two examples. Uh, whether the, the fictitious way converges or not in the presence of the common noise and without the without the common noise and with the common noise. So here this is the, the equilibrium cost or the learned equilibrium cost. So here you see that what you learn is not stable. Here you see that in the orange uh, line, this is the, the, the theoretical value of the cost. And you see that the blue line is the numerical one, and, and you learn the values are not the same. This is absolutely normal. There is one which is with the common noise and one which is without. So they don't, they have, these are not the same problems. And so uh, you cannot see uh, you cannot see the same value. So this is absolutely natural. Anyway, you see that with noise, it behaves better than without noise. Um, and okay, let me let me skip this. One very last thing that I want to mention is that I promised you uh, before this selection result from a numerical point of view. If you remember well, this was the original example that I, I mentioned in the first part of this lecture. So let me move back. I told you I check these coefficients g of x is exactly this if i am starting from zero or i should say differently i have three equilibria zero minus zero five and another one that is positive and the one that is predicted by the theory is minus zero dot five so what i'm going to do is to let my algorithm run starting from a wrong equilibrium so starting from zero <coughs> so i have my fictitious play starting from zero you observe that for this choice of g clearly there is no monotonicity g is not monotonous and by the way you don't have uniqueness of an equilibrium so certainly this is not monotonous as otherwise you would have a unique equilibrium and so what i'm going to do is to let the algorithm run the one i told you before but at the same time i run the algorithm i decrease the value of the intensity of the noise so i start with a big viscosity i let the algorithm run it done something i decrease the viscosity i restart from the computation from the numeric the solution that i reached i do a new uh, a new uh, series of, uh, of iterations I get a new equilibrium. I will start from this. I decrease the viscosity again, and so on and so on. So this is exactly what you have here. So here, what you have is the histogram for the mean state of the population at the terminal time. Remember that in the plots that I showed you, the one with the three solutions, those solutions correspond to the mean state of the population at the terminal time. This is not the state of the population. This is the mean state. But since there is common noise, the mean is random. So this is the histogram of the mean. You have two layers of noise. You have the state of the population, but the state itself is random. So this is the histogram of the mean. So you start with viscosity one, and you see that this is more or less centered around zero. And you see that the, the, the noise is quite large. So the histogram 
as a variance so that is uh, quite uh, which is of order one and then step by step so you you do i don't remember how many iterations you do maybe this is around 20 i don't remember and then you, you learn your you get the first solution you restart from it and you get a new histogram with a smaller viscosity 0 0.9 and you see that you start reducing the size of the variance and you see that as you move forward the variance gets smaller and smaller because at each time you reduce the intensity of the of the noise and at the same time you shift to the left so you see that the mean the mean of the histogram so which is the expectation of the mean state of the population is going to, to move to the left and in the end you are located around minus 0 0.5 which is exactly the equilibrium that is predicted by uh, by the theory because this is the global minimizer of the mean field control so this is just a way to see that this algorithm you can tune progressively uh, the viscosity <coughs> and you recover the phenomenon that uh, that i announced uh, intuitively that this should be the right solution okay i think this is a good point to to, to stop uh, so dance uh, in this afternoon and i think this was better to stop with a, with a picture uh, so thank you for these uh, two days if you have any questions please Yes, certainly this is what it means. Yes, certainly this is what it means. Uh, this is not the way we we, we studied this, but the, I think this is uh, this would be uh, yes this this yes this would be a, a way of randomizing uh, the one algorithm for minimizing uh, the potential that is uh, that is about. Um, I'm not saying that there are not there are no other approaches this algorithm was not designed to solve a potential gain this was designed precisely to work outside the potential case outside the monotonous uh, case but indeed if you want to see that in terms of mean field control this is a way to randomize uh, the solution of the mean field control and to benefit from the randomization from a numerical point of view maybe one question you mentioned in your, your lecture you, you dealt with a problem in finite horizon we can consider many variants like uh, ergonomic problems which are more or more degenerate. So if we put, for instance, uh, some average cost problem, uh, uh, so you, 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 you can do this. So indeed, you can have a look at uh, ergodic mental games. Uh, and uh, so there are some, uh, some existence uh, results. And I would say that the very nice questions are about the long term behavior of games on a finite horizon and how does it converge to a stationary problem. Uh, I'm not an expert in this field, but uh, Pierre, Pierre Cardadegui is an expert in this and uh, he has a series of very nice results about the convergence of the, of the longer, longer horizon uh, mean free games towards indeed uh, a stationary game. And you have uh, very difficult questions about this. And, how do the, the solutions behave in between, between uh, zero and, and the end of time? Uh, so you have indeed plenty of very nice uh, questions about it. But this is indeed, clearly this is very interesting and you can guess uh, possibly many applications, but I didn't mention about this. So, yeah. Oh, if there are no, so many thanks for this wonderful lecture. We learned a lot from the future results.